the best ambassadors for this fellowship program, as I mentioned before, are the people who sat where you sit today. They are among the most dedicated and decorated journalists in the business who share a special experience that went beyond the, the lectures and the field trips um, that we're still planning to do. So, um, But we are fortunate to have four alums here who are now fixtures on the timeline of this program that has spanned more than three decades. First, uh, I'll introduce Jonathan Salant. He is the assistant managing editor uh, politics for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and a member of the second class of the Paul Miller Fellows. He has been a Washington reporter for 36 years, working for Newhouse News Service, Congressional Quarterly, the Associated Press, Bloomberg News, the NG, or the New Jersey Advance, media before joining the Post-Gazette. And earlier this year, he was honored uh, with the induction uh, into the Society of Professional Journalists DC uh, Hall of Fame. Carol Lennig is, is on the end, is a four-time Pulitzer Prize winner, author of three uh, best-selling books, and an investigative reporter who has worked uh, with the Washington Post since 2000. Among the excellent reporting that, that Carol has produced uh, revealed the misconduct and failures of the Secret Service that put President Obama's uh, life at risk, uh, winning her a Pulitzer Prize for national reporting in 2015. That's probably the Secret Service calling. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's another jumper. <laughs> Sadie Gurman is, is next to Carol. She covers the Justice Department and federal law enforcement for the Wall Street Journal. With an emphasis on the intersection of politics and the law, she writes about the Justice Department's leadership and policy priorities ranging from civil rights enforcement and criminal justice issues to terrorism, gun violence, and national security matters. Before the Journal, she was a reporter for the AP and worked for several local newspapers covering police and public safety, including the Denver Post and the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. There's a little Pittsburgh mafia nice. running through here. Uh, lastly, on the end here is, is Arthur Jones, who was just sitting here in December, but he couldn't wait to get back, so we, <laughs> we, hauled, we hauled him back. He is a producer and reporter at ABC News, uh, a member of last year's Paul Miller class, um, and uh, prior to ABC, he was a producer, reporter, and podcaster at CBS News. In 2022, he won a News Emmy for his contributions to CBS Mornings. Also, uh, Arthur also brings to the table um, something that none of us can, I think, uh, can claim. He played defensive back for Indiana University uh, and was a three-time academic All Big Ten selection. He uh, was also awarded the Ted uh, Werrett, Senior Achievement Excellence Award in, in 2016. So welcome to, to everybody here. And because uh, Jonathan is the dean of this group, we're gonna allow him to go first to, to talk a little bit about um, what uh, the, this fellowship meant to them, and then we'll, we'll go around the room and then open it to your, to your questions. So well, Jonathan, kick I, us off. I can't compete with playing a Division One college football, but <laughs> I am the coach of the uh, soft and still first baseman of the softball team that won the media softball league, the Metropolitan Media Softball League in 2021, and we beat NPR in the finals on a, on a walk-off. <laughs> and when I first came to D.C., it tells you how the, the, the demise of regional reporting, I was in a softball league. Uh, I coached the Newhouse team, which we partnered with the Cox Newspapers Bureau were there in the same building, and we played. Thompson was in that league, Thompson newspaper chain, and a couple of other places were in that league, and everybody's gone now. Uh, but I was in second class here. Paul Miller Fellowship uh, actually was, then was twice a, a month. It was all regional reporters, which tells how many regionals we had in Washington. They could fill a class every year. And when Gannett, the Gannett Foundation had started it, uh, Paul Miller was a Gannett executive. And then when they rebranded as the Freedom Forum and put all the money into the museum, they dropped the program and the National Press Foundation picked it up, but it was only doing it once a week. 
and I was on the board of the National Press Club at, the, the, at that point, and the Paul Miller Fellowship was so great that I tried to get the press club and tried to work with the foundation to help fund it so we could keep it twice a, week, twice a month, because that's how good the program was. Uh, one, of the people, one of the people in the program uh, who I, uh, one of my fellows turned out later on when I got married, turned out his aunt had married my wife's uncle, so we had first cousins in common. <laughs> Uh, and the other, one of the other things that I remember most about the, the program, <laughs> but one of the things that most, uh, the, the other thing, one of the other things I wanted to say uh, is one of the people we brought in was a guy named Eddie Mai, who was a former Republican National Committee executive, and he talked about politics for us and became a source of mine. And that fall, he was hired to run the, a New York State gubernatorial campaign and knew nobody in the New York Press Corps except me, who we had just met at the Paul Miller Fellow. Uh, the thing that I remember most about it, frankly, is you know, every time, and I had a reputation in the class for, every time we had a speaker, it was, okay, how do I find the local information? Because that's what I'm here for. I know some of you are national reporters, I know. Uh, I was a purely local, and we needed the, the Syracuse angle for everything. And they knew, as soon as my hand was up, that was the question I was going to raise. Uh, ask, but you got some really good sources, some people I still talk to in here. You learned how Washington worked. Uh, you know, this was my, my second year in, in D.C., and there's still stuff. Uh, other than the, uh, the one year, the couple of years I spent at Congressional Quarterly, I learned more from my two days a week at the Paul Miller Fellow than any other job I had in 36, so now 37 years in Washington. And uh, I, before I stop talking, it's, it's, I need to acknowledge two people who I discovered, learned this morning were in the same Paul Miller class, and I consider of all the regional reporters and all the Paul Miller alumni, those are the two biggest successes. One is sitting a couple of doors down, and that's a Carol Lennig, who worked for, as I recall, Charlotte at the time. And Jim Grimaldi, uh, at the, or James Grimaldi, doesn't go by Jim, James Grimaldi of the Wall Street Journal, who worked for the Orange County Register and the Seattle Times. And all three papers don't have anybody in Washington anymore, as far as I understand, which is, which is too bad. But for those of you who you know, read about the layoffs, I've been laid off twice so far, and so I'm, st I'm still working. So there's hope for, uh, you know, unfortunately we're being c cut back, but hopefully uh, there are still jobs out there for everybody. Thanks, Jonathan. Carol? Uh, what a beautiful <laughs> to come from Jonathan, who we, uh, my class of Paul Miller fellows, all looked up to as the guy who understood how Washington worked and how Congress worked particularly. Um, so thank you. Um, here's what I remember about the Paul Miller Fellowship. First off, I went, the reason that I got into it was I had just arrived at the Knight Ritter Washington Bureau as a regional post up from the Charlotte Observer. So my job was just like Jonathan's, figure out um, how does, what's happening here in the Clinton White House um, and in Congress, how does it interact and affect the North Carolina and South Carolina communities um, and bring it home, right? It was so overwhelming. It was so um, daunting to me at the age of 29. I guess you could say I was a late bloomer. I finally got to Washington when I was 29. But anyway, the bureau chief at the time was like looking at me and, cont and could tell like I was clueless and <laughs> said, I recommend this fellowship program to you. And it was, just as Jonathan said, the best hours that I spent every week were in that fellowship program. I learned so much. They had so many interesting speakers. It kind of boiled down for me, like, where do I go? Where do I, and it also, I have to say, it emboldened me. I don't know if you felt this way, Jonathan, because you were always pretty bold, but it emboldened me to think about the fact that I could find out what the cabinet member was doing in relationship to this policy that was so contentious and controversial in North Carolina. I could go up to Jesse Helms, who, by the way, nearly spat at me multiple times. I could go up to Jesse Helms and demand that he answer a question in the hall and figure out how to get past his guardians. Um, I felt like it was almost like um, a blueprint for how to do the job. And I got a series of guides through a horrible maze. That's what Washington was to me when I got here. And I was so overwhelmed. I'm so happy that um, that I did it. And my class did have Jim Grimaldi in it. And he was always raising his hand, just like Jonathan. Well, how do I bring this home? How do I? And so I, I didn't have to ask any questions, because Jim <laughs> asked all the ones that I wanted. 
Um, I really, really um, feel very devoted to it, and I'm so glad Kevin asked if I'd come speak. And if there's any way I can help boil down Washington for you, again, I was a pretty late bloomer. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really become very successful <laughs> until several years after that, but it was the guide for me getting lift off. And if I can help, um, I'll give you my email and information later, and you're welcome to ask me anything. Um, I uh, just to start off, like you were reading off the um, the things that I say that I cover at the Justice Department, and I I was thinking I haven't covered any of those things in so long because for the past seven years since I've been on this beat, my primary focus has been investigations of Donald Trump, special counsels. I think I'm on my sixth or seventh special counsel at this point, um, and so maybe I should revamp that a little bit, like uh, terrorism. That seems quaint. Sure. Yeah, civil, civil rights. <laughs> civil rights. Oh, we don't have them. So, um, so at any rate, um, I am particularly grateful for this fellowship because I had a. I'm sorry, I'm gesticulating. Um, I had like a. I have had a career trajectory that I don't think exists for many people anymore. Um, in that, I started out in local news, like hyper local news. Um, my in internship was in Joplin, Missouri, which is I went to the University of Missouri, and it's it's right on you know Moarcana right on the corner. And uh, from there, I went to the Rockford Register Star, which was in Rockford, Illinois. That's a crack hub between Milwaukee and Chicago. <laughs> Sorry if you are from there. Um, but I did cut my teeth there as a police reporter and really got some great experience uh, covering the cops. And really, the, you know, the newsroom really showed me the ropes there. From there, I was the night police reporter in Pittsburgh uh, back when the paper was a uh, beloved community institution. Uh, it is regrettably on strike now, uh, and I don't know very many people who still work there. So is what I'm saying. This trajectory just doesn't exist anymore. Then I went to work for my hometown, uh, Denver Post. You know, so I went sort of like I had this sort of small, big, you know, medium-sized, big, bigger, um, and from there I went to the Associated Press in Denver and was lucky enough um, that they thought I was good enough to co cover a, like federal law enforcement that I should or cover DOJ. And it was such a lucky break for, you know, basically a local reporter to move right to Washington from Denver. I have had a blessed career, and I, I don't take that for granted at all. Um, and, but, you know, when you say you're a late bloomer, I didn't get here until I was about 32. So I think that, you know, and I still don't know how successful I am, but... <laughs> But you know, you know, it's a marathon, not a race. And um, uh, but all of that to say that when I um, when I was joined, when I came here, I was an AP reporter who you know had a lot of experience source developing and covering you know police and covering public safety and like all of the challenges that come with writing about local news and source development. But I didn't know about the ecosystem that is Washington and source development and the way you interact with you know, law enforcement officials here is very different um, than in some place like Denver, Colorado. But now uh, you know, I've, I've learned a lot and I have the Paul Miller to thank for that. Thank you, Sadie. Arthur. Yes. So spoken like a true millennial, um, <laughs> our group started a face started a uh, a group chat like the very first 5 minutes of us being in here and we have been the best of friends for the last year and um, I texted him this morning I said what should I tell the next group and as I see the food coming they were like make sure you tell them it's free food every month <laughs> stay for lunch um, but in all seriousness we've become a family um, the Paul Miller fellowship the 20 of us who work at different outlets uh, throughout DC have really become a family and we're all really really good friends and I think it's been an amazing networking opportunity really to network across um, with your peers and with your contemporaries because all of you work for really amazing outlets. You're either on TV, you have this platform already, and then you come together and you, you sit with each other and you have this fellowship every month. And it, we use it as bonding, we use it as socializing, we go to happy hours, we also go to brunch on Sunday. It's honestly just a, a new community for everyone to have. Um, 
And in addition to that, of course, uh, every single one of these sessions is an on-the-record conversation. And you're you're going to be with uh, White House officials. You're going to be with uh, key people in Washington. They're going to be telling you newsworthy scoops a lot of those times. So just remember that you're a journalist doing your job every time you walk in here, and you're sourcing up every time you walk in here. So. I just walked out of here a few weeks ago with my last uh, Paul Miller uh, session, but the, the friendship, the fellowship, um, the community and the family that it's given me, and just like everyone said up here already, you know, you're still in contact with those folks, and I see the same smiling faces and gaggles at the Capitol that I see every month here. So just remember that each and every one of you are going to become a really close family. Well, great, and, and thank you for, for those um, great observations. And I, I want to open up to questions, but I also want to let you know that the questions, sh it, it's, it's all open-ended. It's a free-for-all here. These um, it doesn't have to be about you know, uh, what you took from the Paul Miller program, although I'm sure they have uh, many more stories. These are all uh, people who are um, experts on, on their own, uh, on the beats that they cover. So take advantage of that. Ask them, you know, um, how they do their work, um, what they do, um, how they got to the positions they're, they're in now. So um, this, is, uh, this is an open-ended conversation, so take advantage of it. Thank you. Hi, my name is... I don't know if you can hear. Hi, my name is Aneri. Uh, I'm a reporter with KFF Health News. Um, I was interested in uh, several of you talked about going from like local to state to national. Um, this is my first uh, national reporting job previously working at um, city papers and, and some state outlets. And I'm curious um, to hear your thoughts on sourcing. I found that nationally, particularly in D.C., everyone seems to have a gatekeeper, like there's always a press secretary or a comms person or someone I'm supposed to go through as opposed to at least my impression at the local level is I, I could often just call the person I want to talk to. How do you get around that? Does that ever go away? Do I always have to call the press person? No, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I, I have strong feelings about this. Um, press people can be super helpful. and. Sometimes they are the gatekeepers that make it possible for you to begin the relationship. But I find them um, to be a muffle and a muzzle. They, it, it's not that they're super powerful and they stop communication. It's more that they, their training is often, um, and my kids say, I only write bad government news. And, and if you are writing puffy pieces, then the press people are always going to want to help you and get the inside information and call her about how amazing and heroic their boss is. Um, but when you are trying to piece together things that are hard and contentious, um, find a way to build a relationship with those individuals separate. Always, I think press people can, there are some that are really talented, and I've, I, I'm, I'm delighted that I am collegial and friendly with them. Um, but they are often a break on you being able to get a real story. And they will fill your notebook with stuff that is undocumented and unverifiable and BS. Sorry, you can see how strongly I feel. I often think, and this was not the case, this is not the case for me now, but it was earlier in my career, do a B-plus story about a subject you're really interested in getting to know the sources in. And as soon as you start doing, when I say B-plus, you're not going to hit gold, but you're going to develop a reputation for seriousness, for accuracy, for caring about the issue. And as soon as you do that, you're going to have traction with those people, and they are going to go around their press person to talk to you. They're going to make the effort because you did. Um, just, just to add to that, which is perfect way of describing it. I, what I did when I moved from um, Denver to here, which you know are two different worlds, but what I found is that you should never take anybody for granted from your former life because these people, they go on to be, you know, to, they follow your trajectory. So um, basically, you know, I had a lot, actually had a lot of sources uh, from covering 
police who went on to be, you know, go to the um, FBI and the ATF, and then, you know, they go through the academy when you're coming up through Washington, and then, like, by the time you're here, like, you know, they just are getting higher and higher on the scale and becoming more and more important. And so it's like important to not take those people for granted and assume that you won't need to talk to them. You should always keep in touch with them. It's also been particularly helpful, um, you know, you should always do this when administrations change as well, because it's, you know, it's easy to assume, okay, well, this person left, so I probably just won't, you know, they're good for six months, and then I won't need them again. But um, particularly with the Trump administration, a lot of the people who were sources then are either under investigation now or representing the people who are being investigated. Um, so it's been helpful to have kept in touch with them, and, uh, you know, as well as, you know, former Obama administration people who are now, you know, in some of the highest ranking positions in the Justice Department. So, um, you know, keep in touch, call randomly, mm -hmm. don't need a re like, you don't want to be calling, obviously, when, like, it's shit is hitting the fan, um, but I think the most important lesson I've learned is, like, don't lose touch with anybody. That's one of, actually one of the biggest differences in covering Washington now, governing Washington three decades ago, the, the gatekeepers that uh, outside the House, and I learned this at Congressional Quarterly, uh, how good it was, but I did it even with the Syracuse reporter, uh, outside the House chambers, this is Speaker's Lobby, and you can put in a card and people come out and talk to you. Well, they always used to come out and talk to you. I could go down there for a day and get all six lawmakers I was covering right then, and they'd all come out and talk to you and you didn't have to worry about it. And there was no gatekeeper. And now a lot of them don't come out. They don't come out in part, frankly, because there are some people who want to stick a microphone in their face and get them to say something stupid so they can tweet it out. And it's, it's got your journalism. Uh, when I got laid off from Jersey, 13 of the 14 lawmakers wrote a letter of protest to my, uh, to my editors. And they didn't like everything I wrote. Plus, trust me, I didn't really like everything I wrote. Uh, but they all knew that I was fair and I was interested in issues. Uh, one lawmaker who I will not name by name uh, is used to say, I'll come out and talk to you, but meet me on the first floor because I don't want to be bombarded with all these inane questions. Uh, so that, and so that's part of the problem. The other thing, though, and if those of us who are r local reporters, when I came down to D.C., I'm covering, uh, I spent six years in Albany covering the state government. So I'm, now I'm down in Washington. I'm still covering the state government. I'm covering different people, but a lot of the, the assembly people and the Senate, state senators came to Washington too, so I had these great sources. Even now, as I'm learning a new state, I've been there, that job in March, I'm going to all the Jersey people. Uh, and that's that's you know, 14 people that I can talk to, and they'll tell me everything I want to know because we have this relationship, and that's been a big help, help as well. And also, going on, never mind, never forget these sources. I, uh, in 1996, uh, we're doing a story from I'm, I'm the Congressional Quarterly political, pol Politics team, and the uh, report, my editor says, I've always wanted to do a story on conservative Las Vegas. So I said, let's do the story. I'd love to do that, stop on the way back from San Diego. Uh, so uh, we, there was a political science professor that I talked to there who I stay, I've stayed in touch with ever since. And her name is Dina Titus, now a congresswoman. When I was at Bloomberg News, I'm covering money and politics. I want to do a story on all of this, uh, the people raising all this money early so they could help fend off an attack. Because as a fresh person, you're the most vulnerable of all incumbents. Well, she was willing to open up to me because I'd known her already. So I could get the, the inside stuff that you wouldn't get if you, to go into just some lawmaker off the cuff and say, hey, I'd like you to, to open up to me because I'd known her for so long. I'm not sure if you cover um, Congress, but just like Jonathan was saying, there's so much access there. The first orientation that we had last year, Sung Ming Kim talked to us about how it's the best beat in Washington because you can be this close to the, the lawmaker, the House Speaker at any point in time. Um, so one thing that I do when I'm covering Congress and getting through all of the flax and the press secretaries and whatnot, I'll go to the hearings that I think or that I know those lawmakers are on. And so when they come outside of the hearing and you talk to them about an issue that you know that they're passionate about, they already spent three minutes uh, of their time questioning um, <clears throat> witnesses in that hearing, it, it makes them feel as though you actually know what you're talking about and you're interested in the policy, not just the gotcha moments. So try to meet them where they are, um, especially if you have that access to them.
Um, hi, I'm Valerie Yerk with CQ Roll Call. Um, I've been covering Congress for, I guess, a little over a year now. And I think one of the things that, um, candidly, I sh struggled to get used to at first or to work around was a lot of like the the scoop culture, like tweet it first kind of like quick news. Um, and I mean, it seems clear that you guys, you know, d didn't build careers off of off of that. Um, and so I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, advice you can any advice you could impart on the kind of route that um, it seems a lot of journalists are taking in Congress and, you know, how to kind of avoid that or work with it or, you know, any any advice there. of reporting that you you know the, the the skills that you need you know that are most valuable are source development and you know quality writing uh, and that's going to shine through even that's going to shine through the social media like barrier basically I mean like I think about people like Carol and I think about people like Maggie Haberman and just you know all the big names that you know and I'm like I know them because of their work their stories their scoops and because that they got because they had sources because of something that they posted online or like some video that they took. Um, and I just think, you know, it rises to the top. So don't get distracted, um, you know, by people who want you to do more like, I mean, don't get distracted by the minutia of Twitter and the internet, I think, just because at the end of the day, like that stuff's gonna shine through and that editors are gonna notice that. and. You know, that's how I don't even know how to use like a lot of things. And so that's how I don't, ha you know, I use a day planner, so I don't even know. Um, but like, so, so that's how, I mean, that's, that's how we got here. So, um, yeah. And some of it also is your editors that, you know, I was, at, when I was at Bloomberg with, they invented social media. And the rule was you never broke a story on Twitter. You wrote stories. So if, so, so if somebody else wanted to break the story on Twitter for the, the whatever characters, I, I got a news tip, and I can then report and have a really in-depth story, usually before they did, because they're too busy putting it on Twitter. So we use it as, it's, a, it's a great place to find uh, sources, and not sources, to find what's trending and story ideas. Uh, I did the fact the Fetterman hoodie story came because people were tweeting, and I said, oh, we should do this story. And we did an, actually a fun, I had a fun, fun part of it, but I wouldn't have known that because he's not announcing it, but publicly, but you see it on Twitter, it's trending, and say, oh, I should do this story. Um, but as far as, like, getting those scoops, I mean, just, I would say staying in touch with your sources, um, because in asking them if you can print something ahead of time um, so that you don't see it from, uh, you know, a Politico reporter on Twitter 30 seconds later, just asking them the day before or the week before, is there anything that I can, can get out there ahead of time? the Paul Miller Fellowship, um, or at least I first heard it here. Uh, there's, a, the, there's a suggestion in your question that there's pressure to look sexy on Twitter, right? To, to, to have a great little scooplet or hit. And uh, a person who gave a speech here who is, uh, you know, kind of the dean of Carolina reporting at the time, um, talked about the red meat theory. And his view was, when you're young, you're going to be under some pressure to deliver volume. Um, and we all went through that. None of us are immune. Nobody starts off with like, oh, we'd like you to be an investigative reporter and take a year to figure this out. Nobody starts there. Um, but pull together string in your beat, in your free time, in your leisure, at night in between calls while you're waiting for people, pull together the string that you feel gives you the exclusive deep story that Sadie was talking about before. And then when you have your red meat, hang it up for your editor and say, this is what I have. Uh, and they cannot turn it down. They are dogs, right? They cannot turn down that you have this, this potential um, and they will live. They will make space and time for you. You know what I mean. They will give you the freedom. So I, I, I am still the same Machiavellian strategist about like I'm going to wait until I have all the red meat before I tell the editors um, this is where 
where I'd like to go. Yeah. This guy's been raising his hand a lot. <laughs> Okay, yeah. You're next, I promise. <laughs> um, this is just sort of like a, a follow-up, perhaps a little bit of a pushback, if that's okay, on some of the answers to the last question. You wouldn't be a reporter if you didn't push back. <laughs> uh, as someone who was recently laid off from a full-time staff reporter job, I've been thinking a lot about the distinction between sort of building your personal brand as a reporter versus building your brand for the outlet that you're working for when many of these outlets are downsizing or don't exist anymore or those sorts of things. And unfortunately, these sort of like put it all out there, tweet first, things are the ways that a lot of people can build audiences that attract other editors or TV contracts or those sorts of things. So how do you think about uh, when you're reporting and when you're highlighting the work that you're doing or your colleagues are doing, what your loyalty is to the brand that you work for, the publication, the TV network, et cetera, and also your own personal brand as a reporter who owns XYZ Beat? I feel like, um well, to, to echo what these guys said, like I, I've worked for I work for the journal. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have put this here. <laughs> I, I work for the journal and I work for AP, which means like literally that you don't have a byline on your story. So um, I've always put the brand before the the person. But um, you know, I do recognize the need to like increasingly promote yourself as an entity. And so I think like I would try to you know um, go on TV, uh, do like television hits um, if you can to talk about your work. Just find other ways to like sort of showcase your reporting um, that are within the guidelines of your organization. Because like if I do that now, um, if I tweet something out now ahead of time, or if I'm flashy, or if I say anything even remotely um, opinionated or flashy, like I will be fired. So um, you just have it is like a delicate balance. But like I do recognize the need to promote your your brand, um, and I think there's ways to do that without um, breaking the rules. I think. Well, some of it, frankly, is, you know, I could give a body of work uh, when I got laid off both times. I could give the Dirksen Award. I could give the Toner Award. I could give all these other awards. So when I got laid off, I had a body of work, my best clips, that somebody else was interested in. And it's happened, you know, it's happened to me twice now. And none of it because I don't have a brand. Uh, I don't even wear designer clothing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my wife works at Macy's downtown, so she, she, so she dresses me. Uh, but the, uh, but you know, people, editors, and news organizations still want good work uh, more than anything else, more than the buzz, and you know, and it's nice to send. I applied one place, and I could send chapter and verse of all the stories that they credited me on, uh, and say this is. This is sort of I broke that you followed. This is sort of I broke that you followed, and st you can do stuff like that. I think that's frankly more effective. If you know, again, if it's a buzz, a buzzy place, I wouldn't fit. Frankly, I'm going to be 70 next month. I wouldn't fit in a buzzy place. Okay, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to want to work at a place like that. That that's what they care about. Frankly, I want to. I we need to work at a place that does, frankly, old-fashioned journalism. The difference is is now we're all multimedia journalists. Uh, you know, I was up with Nikki Haley in New Hampshire to do a piece on Pittsburgh people going door to door for her. I was the photographer. Uh, in Jersey, we did a lot of video, and I took a lot of video that I, we posted on the, on the page. So you have to be willing to do other stuff. It's no longer, you know, bring my props, no longer just a notebook. Uh, but, it's, uh, but it's still journalism, and it's still real. Here are the facts. Here's what's going on. Here's stuff that I'm telling you that they didn't want you to know. And that's, I think, still the key. I'll just add one thing, and I, just to follow up on what Carol said, and that is when you, uh, when, when you have the goods on something, and even if you're working freelance, um, it's and in an, an environment where, in which we're working now, when so many news organizations have been downsized, fortunately in your case as, as well. Um, Editors are not going to turn down the goods, even if it comes from outside um, their company. They they may um, it may take a little longer to get uh, to get to where you want to go, but it, a good story is a good story. And and if you have um, you have the information, I think that um, news organizations, given their the state of play now, I think will be anxious to grab it up. It's just a matter of you know, you reaching out and finding, you know, a landing spot for it. Yeah. 
I have one little thing to say about your question, which is um, it's undeniable that you branding yourself, journalists branding themselves is a, um, not a necessity, but um, a reasonable huge temptation, right? Because you then become this entity that your organization has to take seriously, more seriously. It's the news, just as Kevin said, it's the sourcing, it's the good writing, it's the things you bring them that are exclusive that make you special. But um, there are ways, and I would echo something Sadie said about being on other medium like television, radio. If NPR calls and says, you know, Washington Week wants you to come on, I mean, that's not going to happen right away. But, you know, if, some, if they come on and they want you to come on at the, the 6.30 part of the show for a quick interview about one of your stories, do it. Every single time someone asks you on another medium to come and talk and it, and it meets the standards, do it because, um, you know, going back as, as far as, like, one of my role models, Dana Priest, she was, you know, really a legend in investigative reporting on the CIA like and the NSA, like the most sensitive reporting that almost nobody can pierce. And her brand <laughs> helped her. Um, it, it was, of course it was the news, of course it was the sourcing and the exclusivity, but her branding and her willingness to be a persona that um, sources around Washington were aware of, you know, she was on CBS, she was on TV, um, gave her a little gravitas. And I know that sounds sucky, because it is. Um, uh, and it won't come for you all immediately. But little bit by little bit, I mean, you know, go on C-SPAN even. What's the, what's the? C-SPAN. Yes. The, show. the morning one, like yeah. the Republican Democrat Washington line. Washington Thank Journal. you. Do that one. It's a pain in the neck. It's early in the morning. It's Do so it. good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and, and you will be noticed by more people than you think. I was in Washington Journal once. It was the local angle of bu budgets, me and James Grimaldi. <laughs> <laughs> I will just say We should call him today. <laughs> in addition to knowing you for your amazing scoops, I also know you for your beautiful kitchen uh, that has appeared many times on MSNBC. <laughs> Which my husband is like, if I have to clean that kitchen one so, more time. There you go. It's proof. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you have a question. Too. Oh, no, wait. You, 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 you. Okay. you. Um, Hello, uh, my name is Philip Jackson. Um, so I started off first like co covering policing locally. Um, so I did have a question for Sadie, um, but obviously could be relevant to everybody. Um, so like I, most of the cities that I had covered, every police department was under a federal consent decree, like <laughs> Memphis, <laughs> Memphis, Baltimore, Philadelphia. Wow. Um, wow. So now that I'm like covering policing and stuff like that on a national level, I wanted to know, like, have you noticed, like, a drastic change between administrations, um, specifically in, like, the Civil Rights Division? So, like, one thing I'm kind of, like, noticing, in my understanding, is I feel that um, with, like, Christine Clark, like, it's a little bit more aggressive compared to, like, the previous administration. So I wanted to know, like, if you noticed that and how you've navigated through that. Yeah. Through, like, your reporting and stuff like that. Well, I think that your experience is very similar to mine, and I love this question because um, when I was in Pittsburgh, they were under consent decree. When I was in Denver, they were under consent decree. Um, for you know, or they were various things were being federally investigated because it was the Obama administration, and they 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 took a similar aggressive approach toward investigating civil rights violations in police departments that this administration is taking. Um, so that that experience covering those things locally, like, um, helped me, it's really helped me build sources with the civil rights division here and with people who care about that kind of work here in Washington because I saw, I've seen it from the other side. Whereas if I hadn't have covered those police agencies, I wouldn't have known, how, you know, the sort of intricacies about what those pattern or practice investigations are, like, you know, how expensive it is for one, but also like, you know, how the community really appreciates it. So um, I seen it from that angle. And then by the time, so then I came here and started covering Trump and it was just like the guardrails were just like ripped off. They stopped doing that kind of work almost ex entirely. Their whole thing was like Jeff Sessions back the blue. Uh, you know, we got a, um, they stopped doing that type of, um, far-reaching investigation and started 
you know, I think sending military equipment to police departments. So I also had from covering local, local, yeah, you broke that story. <laughs> I remember that. Because I was like, oh, that's my story. Um, but like it helped, it helped to have the local experience for that too. Because if you covered the cops beat, you know, cops and, you know, um, a lot of them, you know, pr was a really good promote. Story. Yeah, so good. <laughs> they promote into different capacities. And like, you know, if you covered the cops beat in your town, you've probably talked to FOP people and you've probably talked to police unions. And so they're going to get the heads up about things that are that they like, uh, you know, that they're happy about, and they can tell you that too. So it's like, it's like a win-win to have that experience. Um, and then now, of course, I think the Biden administration is even more aggressive on policing. That was one of their huge priorities. It's something I've covered a lot, and um, because I'm one of the few people on this beat, well, I guess not the few people, but because I am one of the people on this beat who's had the experience covering local. Co cops and crime and uh, you know federal investigations from that standpoint I think like people at DOJ trust me to understand how it works and bring me these kind of stories you know so definitely it's great it's that's like what I built my whole like career on was writing that kind of stuff yeah I wanted to, to follow up on sourcing what do you do when you have gotten past the press secretary and maybe like you have the person's number or you've taken them to dinner like how do you build that relationship especially if they're not taking you seriously sometimes it feels like as a young person yeah. or even as a young woman like how do i get them to tell me the stories that you know they really shouldn't be telling me <laughs> yeah. so um my answer to you i hope it will be helpful uh, because, like, uh, I'm going to give you a little pricey about me. I think it has something to do with my voice, but at the newsroom, I became known, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, as the person who could get people to answer questions that were total strangers, like a cold, cold call. So I always was put on duty for mass shootings, sadly. And every single, you know, few weeks or months, there would be a mass shooting, right? And and I have one chance to get that person to talk to me because I'm dialing that for dollars. Like I'm just, I have a list of numbers, victims, family members, victims, sister, shooters, mother, shooters, sister, um, shooters, employer. Right? I have one chance to get that person to engage with me. And you know, there's a joke. You know, Carol just has like a big sister voice, like the. People are calm when she calls, and that's why she has a good return on investment. But, <laughs> but really, what it was was de was deciding two things. I have to in those seconds, and you're you're going to have longer than seconds. But I hope this is instructive. I think what is the motivation for this person to speak to me? Actually, that's not true. I think the first thing I think is what is the fear that keeps this person from talking to me? And what is the motivation that could get them to talk to me? And I feel like I have literally in my, in the, in the exp experience I'm describing to you, I have seconds to honestly address that. I know you may not want to talk to me, Mrs. Jackson, because you're just learning about, you know, what's happened with your son. But if you can't tell me about, and you may be worried about saying something without the rest of your family, or this is very stressful time and you need time to think, and I want you to have time to think. And on the motivation side, but if you don't share with me a little bit about your lost family member, no one is going to understand who, what, what's been lost. No one's going to understand that person. And if it's the shooter, everyone's going to describe this person as a monster, and I need you to help me understand the bigger picture about that person. So I'm always thinking fear, motivation, and most, and the underpinning of that is honesty. Like you have to be genuine. You can't be selling them something you're not gonna deliver. You have to be honest in every interaction. Almost like, sorry to use this reference, cop reference, but like almost like you're reading them a, a Miranda warning. Like this is gonna be in the newspaper. I wanna walk you through how we would use this and what you're comfortable with. So forgive me because I'm not sure that that is applicable to a government bureaucrat that you're trying to get you to tell the whole story to, but I think even without the urgency, those two things help. Just to build on that, um, I have a voice of a child and I look like a social worker, so I don't have this going for me at all. But, um, 
But I just think you got to be part of the fabric. You got to be part of the, the fabric. You know, go, you got to just not leave. Just keep coming back. Keep showing up places where they're going to be, um, even if it's not something you're going to write about. Just show up there. Um, uh, last night, um, and also, also then when it does, when it is, there's time to. It comes time to actually write about this person. No surprises. Um, you know, you let them know exactly what you're going to say, and then I think that even if it's a negative story, those people come to trust you because. You, they, they weren't caught off guard. Um, but I would just say keep showing up, don't give up, keep calling them. Um, just really, you know, especially as a woman, a young woman, I just feel like you have to prove them wrong. Just like show up and write the story, write the story that they think you don't know. Um, you can do it. It's, you'll, get, you'll get it. You know, in 47 years of journalism, I've never gotten used to making a phone call and saying, you have just lost your son, you just lost your daughter, you just lost your mother, how do you feel? I hate that, but, and this is the big but, uh, I covered the uh, crash, uh, the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. First came to Washington, so it was my first year here basically. Uh, and it was uh, 35 kids in the Syracuse University Overseas Study Program were there. And they wanted to talk to you. First of all, you were a local paper, uh, but second of all, they wanted to know that their kids did not die in vain. And by telling you the stories, they could get, maybe they could put pressure on government to act. And it did happen and put pressure on government to act. Uh, and they wanted that. And that was, that you were actually doing God's work in that case. Because you were making it possible for them to influence government and pay, pass all those airline security laws. But I, I, I mentioned it also because you talk about the, uh, how you build sources. 1980, this is, yeah, it was a 1988. Was it 88? Yeah, 1988. <laughs> sorry. It's 19, 19, no, it's, uh, sorry, 1988. Yeah, 1988. Uh, Dan Quayle's the vice president, going to be vice president nominee, tournament vice president. He's, he's going to fly into Syracuse and do a, and speak. And at that point, after all those gaffes, they wouldn't go, let him go anywhere near the press to do a press conference. So my editor comes up with this brilliant idea who says, Go out with him a couple of days early and travel around with him and write a story on what to expect when he lands. What's he going to tell you? Well, when you go out on the, the road, you know, they're going to make four stops a day at different airports. That's eight trips to the airport, back, back and forth, eight times a day where he's available for an interview. And I get an interview with him. And, uh, but more importantly, his press secretary, a guy named Dave Prospery, after the election, quail wins, Prosper becomes the chief spokesman for the Department of Transportation. And having this little paper in Syracuse with a Washington guy who now has a direct line into the Transportation Department, which is doing all the airline security stuff. This is before the Homeland Security. So I was so every time this, they had a big round table, I was there and could ask the, the Transportation Secretary, what are you going to do about airline security? Look at the people from Flight 103. And, they, and the parents knew that too. And I was almost, I, really not an advocate, I'm doing my job as a journalist, but they were very happy that that was the highest level, only because of you're, you're in the right place at the right time, trying, to, trying you, to build those sources. You make your own luck, right? Come on, you <laughs> made yourself in the right place. Okay, right here. Um, hi, my name's Mike. I'm a uh, video journalist with the AP, and this is a question, well, more specifically for Arthur, but if anybody has anything to add. You know, um, working in video in Washington, I feel like sometimes the camera itself is a barrier, especially when you're trying to talk to people at a higher level. I mean, Congress is a little different. Sometimes they're you know, willing to jump in front of the camera. But um, I find when it comes to sourcing and things like that, um, the camera kind of becomes the barrier itself. And if you have any advice on working through that as someone who works with a camera, um, I'd appreciate that. So normally, as a, as a producer, I'm not holding the camera, I'm not shooting. Um, so for myself, and if you're a producer but you have the camera with you, I would just go to them without it. Uh, and usually um, I tell them that you know, we can speak, but I would like to let you know that you know, after we have our conversation, if there's any of that, any of those moments that we could potentially take and, and put on TV. I'm only here for X amount of time. 
Uh, I have a story that's running at 6 p.m. tonight, and I would really like to talk about X, Y, and Z. And perhaps some of the other stuff that they spoke with you about in that 30 seconds, they don't want to use, but the moment that you need is, you know, just a short you know, snippet of that. So usually I talk to them without the camera. I tell the camera guy to move aside for a second and we just talk um, one on one. And then I kind of bring in the fact that, OK, if you've got one extra minute to to go that route with me, uh, I would really appreciate that because usually um, I'm not actually holding the camera, so I don't walk up to them with and it's not I'm not as intimidating um, in that sense. So um, just try to get to them and put your camera off to the side somewhere for a minute. But that's usually what I do. Because I just had to do that on, on Monday at the um, Biden speech in Manassas uh, when all the protesters came. So we were doing some MOS and Biden's team wasn't, uh, didn't really want us to talk to people. And we were like, that's what we're here for. We're, <laughs> we're journalists. We have a six o'clock deadline for our show. So, you know, we told our camera crew to um, stay in the other room. And then we brought them closer to the press room after we just talked to them for a couple of minutes. And most of them gave us, you know, an extra minute of their time and we got what we needed. All right. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, but um, Diego, I cover labor policy for uh, Bloomberg Industry Group in Congress. Um, I have two questions, if I may. Again, I'm a journalist, right? So I got to do um, the first one is I, you know, like I said, I'm a policy reporter, and since you come from a, a, a local journalism background, I think there's some parallels there, which is sometimes, you know, especially in Congress, there is a lot of national news going on, and you know, there's not a lot of labor policy getting done in a Congress that not they can't even pass the budget, right? So, and I don't get assigned a lot of stories actually. Never I get assigned any stories, which can be, you know, pretty freeing. But at the same time, you know, you always have to come up with ideas. Um, and I think with your local background, could maybe give some advice on how you always find, you know, how to bring it home, I guess you were saying earlier, um, and how you can always, between the noise, uh, how you can find a good story uh, that's very specific um, and that, can be attractive, right? Because editors always ask, well, is that going to pass? And, you know, it might be a very interesting bill. And you say, well, obviously not, you know, uh, but it, maybe it's still worth telling the story. Um, and the second question is um, I'm somewhat obsessive with the writing um, that, you know, I always want to get better. So, a question how do you do that? How do you, like, perfect it, the writing? cleaner, you know, uh, more precise, uh, stronger writing going forward. Always want to, you know, improve it. Well, I'll, I'll tell one thing about labor is that uh, you've got people in Congress, even if they don't have any power at this point, Don Norcross, uh, for the only labor, uh, only like union business leader who ever got elected to Congress. He has, there's a labor caucus. And they can tell you some of the problems. Uh, I, you know, I remember they, 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 there are a series of conferences around, and you could travel because you're at Bloomberg, uh, conferences around talking about the future of work. What's work going to look like? This was a few years ago uh, in the, in the, with all the, the gig economy and everything. Just looking at that issue is, can be an issue. Is any going to think? No, but this is, what the discuss, this is what's discussing. And those, and those people also, here are the problems. You can always write about the problems or the benefits. Uh, what's being done? How are, how are the, you know, and the, and the lawmakers are a lot in the middle of this stuff. Uh, you've got the, the labor committee, right? The health committee, which health, education, you know, labor. Uh, it's in the, it's in Democratic hands in the Senate. They're pro labor. They're p probably st staff members who could help you and talk about and go to them. To, what what aren't we covering? Uh, you, you union leaders, if you're getting if you're local, you know some of the local union people. But even the AFL CIO, they want the coverage. Those are, those are the people to go to on things that, in terms of writing, you write. I've, I've done, I've, actually I've done programs, uh, the Press Foundation has it, the Press Club has it, IRE has it, SPJ has it, and go to some of those programs, uh, writing seminars, uh, the Pointer Institute, I know I did one for a week in, in, Washington, in, uh, in Florida and came back as a much better writer. Uh, Roy Peter Clark did that. Yeah, John, that's what I was gonna say. John Camp. 
uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, feature writer for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Uh, people like that, he, in fact, Camp said the person he, his idol was John McPhee, mm -hmm. a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. I bought, bought his book to read it. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at some of the people that you, that you idolize in, the, in, the, in print, the J Wall Street Journal, the page that, that the, uh, whatever had. that's called on page they one. Had. Yes. Yeah. Uh, some of the, the, the uh, Barry Birak at the Washington Post. I used to be at the New York Times. You've been Miami Herald when I was at the Herald. And you look at him and say, wow, I'd like to write like that. Uh, Sarah Reimer, another Herald reporter is in the, in the 70s who went to the Times. And you just look what they do that you are not doing. And that's how you become a better writer. And if you can't afford to go to a conference or they won't send you or you don't have time, like you could find someone in your office that you really admire their work and at, like buddy up to them and, you know, ask them to read your stuff. And that's what I have always done. John Tamari. He's the guy I would recommend. Also writing for different mediums helps. So uh, radio, digital, TV, print, and uh, I'm assuming you're mostly print and digital, but, you know, also cutting your teeth with radio, cutting your teeth with, with TV, if you all have a, a TV station or a affiliate that you work with. Um, uh, Leanne Caldwell from the Washington Post spoke to us last year about the different ways of writing for different mediums and how it's made her a better journalist over the years. I also think I've worked at two different outlets now. Just the, the amount of editors that I've worked with and learning from them. So a lot of my features are done by one person. A lot of these kind of day of air types of stories are done by another person and I've done you know, White House stories and then Congress stories are done by another. So the different editors that you work with will also help you as a writer, you know, learning different styles and um, being edited, you know, um, aggressively. You know, we, we promised the folks this would be an hour. Uh, we're going over a little bit if you all are okay with it. Um, and we have time for two more first year. Um, I think this is probably a good one kind of sort of to wrap up. Um, I know you guys spoke a little bit at the beginning. Oh, I'm Alex from Cox Media Group. Um, spoke a little bit at the, about the beginning at the beginning about the best things you learned. Um, but I'm more curious now about like getting the most out of this program. I am the way I've been phrasing it is I'm not new to DC, but I'm new to Washington. Um, I worked at NBC Four for many years, and now I'm working. Um, Doing, covering Washington for other local news stations like all over the country. And every day I'm realizing I don't know what I don't know. Um, and trying not to sound ignorant or naive, but um, every day I'm like, oh, I had no idea that's how that worked. And I thought of myself previous to getting into this job as someone who is relatively Washington savvy um, and realizing now that that's not really the case. Um, but I'm excited you know, to learn more, so I'm curious things that you look back on and you still remember from the program, and also things you're like, oh, I, I wish I had done this, beyond just you know asking every question that pops into your head. You know, I apologize, but I don't think that I have something from the fellowship that makes me go, oh, this was my, I mean, other than my introductory remarks about how I felt like it was a blueprint for Washington. I think the answer to your question, if I can be so presumptuous, is, Dive in, you know, dive into a story. And as soon as you, um, you know, there's a new reporter competing with Sadie at the Washington Post named Perry Stein, brand new to DOJ, poor, poor kid, right? Tossed into the deep end while Trump is under investigation in three different places. Um, you know, her strategy has been head first. I'm going to figure out what, what this means. I'm going to figure out how it works. I'm going to write. I'm going to ask a million people questions. You know, as soon as you start getting the answers to some of the questions, it's going to lead to broader and broader and broader knowledge. I'll give you one other piece of advice that I did actually hear reverberate at the Paul Miller Fellowship, which was the sage advice of Gene Roberts. He was the dean, uh, forgive me, he was the executive editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer when the Inquirer was called the Pulitzer Factory. Um, and he was my first editor, although we barely saw each other. Um, I was a, you know, indentured servant at the Philadelphia Inquirer when I left college. Um, he said all the time, zig when everybody else is zagging. Like, go someplace other people aren't digging. Start digging, and you're going to be shocked at the answers to your questions. And everybody else is going to go, whoa, 
I didn't know that was happening. That kind of accidentally happened to me with Secret Service. Nobody had Secret Service for a beat. Um, they came home in this humiliating, um, you know, return to Washington in the middle of a hooker scandal in Cartagena, and I just decided to keep dialing for dollars, you know. I'm sorry, that's such a crass phrase, but, um, <laughs> and I thought, okay, this hooker thing is interesting, but then I learned something more interesting, even more and more interesting, which is that agents believed President Obama was going to be killed on their watch. And they told me how, why they believed it, they showed me how, and it was where, Every, nobody was zigging there, you know. Nobody was zigging there. I, I went because Gene Roberts, a million years ago, told me to. Um, I'm from DC, but I think I joined this um, program to learn Washington, and it, they're they're vastly different <laughs> places. Um, DC is more so, if you ask a native or a local, the culture or the, the blood of this city, the people here, um, the music, the neighborhoods, the, just the, the atmosphere. And, and Washington is just this place within DC that people either see on TV or watch in press conferences and they think of um, Schoolhouse Rock, right? So federal government. Um, so I joined um, as someone who, who works in news, who works in politics, to learn more about that. And the first orientation that we had, again, with Sung Min Kim, um, they were talking about the three Ps of Washington. So power, politics, and policy. So power, who are the powerful people here? Who are the leaders of Washington? Not just the president, but uh, again, the House Speaker uh, and the other different branches of, of the government, uh, the Supreme Court, um, that those people and those players, um, who around them can you talk to or get to so that you can understand the power of this city. Uh, the policies, the policies that matter, whether it's the border or whether it's you know, inflation, um, the economy, the policies that really matter in this city uh, to those powerful people and just the politics of it all. Why did it take Kevin McCarthy 15 rounds to become speaker? What was the politics around it? Was it all Matt Gates' fault or, or you know, the Freedom Caucus? what was actually happening there. And if you learn those three Ps, which again, I learned last year um, at 28 years old and I had been living in this city 28 years, you know, um, you will have a deeper understanding of Washington and how to cover the news here. I got one, one other question. I don't want to cut anybody off, but we're barreling toward the finish. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, thank you all for your time. Uh, first off, go Qs. Um, <laughs> second, um, I wanted to ask, like, um, you know, I have the limited experience outside of my job in D.C., and I'm tasked with covering an amorphous beat of Congress for a, an amorphous audience at Newsweek. How do you develop, um, you know, expertise and do good work when you're not really being assigned many stories and you're kind of having to do this very large, expansive beat? Well, some of it is being there, uh, and it's... You're know, finding, finding a, digging, you're know, finding a beat. I mean, I did a lot of stuff here. I was at AP and Bloomberg. I was the, the campaign finance reporter, something that I had always followed and developed an expertise on that. So you're looking for those angles. When there's a defense bid bill and, the, and they, add the, uh, they add some program that the Pentagon didn't want, what's the first thing you do? You check the campaign donations and discovered that, sure enough, they had a fundraiser for the chairman of the committee a month before they added the, the thing to the bill. Uh, at that type of, a, of an angle, whatever expertise. I mean, there's a lot of stuff with justice. I mean, I really have no sources in justice, and I don't do anything in justice. But they do, and they know all that stuff. And if they see something, because you, you've been here for a while, you know, go to press conference, just to go, go, to, go to the speaker's press conference, just to show the flag. Uh, Newsweek, you know, Newsweek's still a really big name. People care about Newsweek. Uh, go to, uh, the, the, when, uh, McConnell and Schumer do their, their gaggles after the luncheons. Just to be there, people see who you are. Say hello, see what they're talking about. Say, this sounds interesting, let me explore it further. I, well, I think we're, we'll end it there. Unfortunately, I know there's probably a dozen more questions we, we could ask, uh, but uh, join me in thanking this great group uh, of alums. <laughs>